Sigali swagwek, hat kahuni niyung get sugwe huene o kalelia zaizi niyung get so sunage, wagwapo niwagita loda, oniota aga niwagayuhun joda, delagone niwagenyo. So, hello everyone. I just introduced myself in my language. My Oneida name is Leah, or my Oneida name is Hatkahuni. My English name is Leah, and I am Oneida, I'm Wolf Clan, and I'm from the place where the ducks gather, which is just outside Green Bay, Wisconsin. So thank you for joining us at the Indigenous Farming Symposium. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen for you all. Okay, I think I did it. Maybe not. Please hold. <laughs> I can see it. You can see the presentation? Yes, well, the 2022 Indigenous Farming Symposium. Yeah, you can yeah. see the title slide, but not my notes. No, no notes. Okay. Okay, great. So, um, this is the first Indigenous Farming Symposium. It's virtual because we are all still living in a virtual world um, and it's just two hours. So hopefully um, we can keep your attention the whole time. Um, and this is really put together to honor and highlight the amazing Indigenous agriculture um, projects and programs that are happening across the USET region. I'm the Agriculture Program Manager at United South and Eastern Tribes. USET is a membership organization, so we have 33 member tribal nations all across our region, which stretches from the Northeast Woodlands down to the Everglades and then across the Gulf of Mexico. And we have three primary program areas that we operate within. So we have the Tribal Health Support Program, we have an Economic Development Department, and then I work in the Office of Environmental Resource Management. So um, this was put on as a partnership with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. It's a branch of the USDA that offers technical assistance and financial support for conservation in agriculture and natural resources management. So the great thing about putting together this event was that I got to work with a lot of amazing native leaders who are working on food sovereignty all across the region. And I got to get in touch with a lot of native producers that I either had relationships with or built relationships with in the process of this. And so the outcome is that everybody who fills out an evaluation after the, the symposium is over on Thursday will get this awesome native made gift box. So you'll get Bedre chocolate. Uh, Tonka bar, um, roasted white corn flour from Gakuyo Farms at Seneca, uh, sweetgrass hand sanitizer spritz. Um, the little trivet there in the middle will actually have the USET logo on it, and then some coffee from Thunder Island uh, Roasters, and then some syrup from Passamaquoddy Maple. So these are flavors from across the USET region. It really shows the diversity of, um, of foods that we produce. Um, there are a lot of foods that we produce in the region that aren't shown here, um, but that hopefully will make their way into the next uh, food symposium. The chocolate and the Tonka bars are not from the region, but they're pretty, um, you might have seen them in stores. Um, they're pretty widely available. And I just thought it like really it rounded out the box. So I hope that you all um, fill out the evaluation. It'll be, um, there'll be time to do that on Thursday at the end. And then you also get an email that has um, more information about that and you can fill it out afterwards. As long as you get it back to us by March 11th, um, we should be all good to go and you should get your box the following week. So we had uh, one of our speakers wasn't able to make it this morning, which is very sad, but now you get to hear more about a farm that I helped start. It's not in the USET region, it's actually in Wisconsin um, on the unceded territory of the Menominee is actually where our reservation is. Um, and so um, this is a farm that I helped start about seven years ago. It's a co-op 
and um, it's called Oheilagu, which means in Oneida among the corn stalks. So I'm um, just going to tell you a little bit about our traditional connection to agriculture, um, how that got disrupted, and then how we're remembering our roots and adapting to the challenges of today. Um, this is a picture of Sky Woman falling from the sky world down to Turtle Island. This is part of our creation story. And you can see that she's holding a lot of plants in her hands. She also had seeds that she brought with her to Turtle Island. And I'll talk a little bit more about those seeds and the significance to us. I'm Oneida, Oneota Aga is the people of the Standing Stone. Um, we're part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. So Haudenosaunee means people of the longhouse. And we formed a treaty about 600 years ago um, to uh, put down our weapons as warring nations and become a peaceful uh, confederacy of nations. So this shows our original five nations that were part of the confederacy. We had a sixth nation that joined us. So sometimes you'll also hear us referred to as six nations. You might also hear us referred to as the Iroquois, um, but that is not how we refer to ourselves typically. It's just not um, a, a Haudenosaunee name. So Haudenosaunee is our word for ourselves. Ungwehue is another word that we use for ourselves, and that was part of my introduction, and that just means original people. So I just wanted to share a little bit about the background of sort of those seeds that came from Sky Woman. And she uh, was a crucial part of our creation story. Women actually play a crucial part of our creation story and our society, our Haudenosaunee society. And this picture is a beautiful painting done by uh, Oneida artist on Dark Mountain. And it shows how the three sisters are related to one another. The three sisters are the corn beans and squash. They're part of our ancestral foodways. And in, our, in the old days, we're a central part of our daily responsibilities, our ceremony cycle, and our trade. So the majority of our diet came from the three sisters. We call them Junkenkwa, or the sustainers. They sustained our lives. And we did this through um, a lot of different um, approaches, but today they would be called probably permaculture, organic, low-till. Um, we did crop rotation. So I like to say that we're the hipsters of regenerative agriculture. This all was built around our life in the longhouse, which centered on women who headed up each clan or family. So I'm Wolf Clan, my mom is Wolf Clan, and all of my female predecessors are Wolf Clan. And we all trace our lineage back to Sky Woman. So my identity is directly related to that of my mother. The, the woman would be um, overseeing her clan. Husbands would marry into the clan and join that longhouse. And the women would also choose the chiefs. Um, who would sit in a council and have to come to consensus on big decisions. If a chief was not acting properly, he would be removed from that seat and they would put a new chief in. Otherwise, it was a lifetime appointment. Um, this was a time of great abundance. This was a time of great food security. And it was also a time of uh, village rotation around our territory, our original territory, which is now New York. So we would pick up our villages and move them every couple of decades. The men would go ahead and clear the fields and set up the longhouses. And then once that was ready, the rest of the village would come behind them. And this allowed the land to rest in between our utilization of the resources. So it was really maintaining that balance and harmony. And I'll talk about that and why that's so important as well. So we are now on a small reservation. We don't have as much land to rotate around. And as a result, the land has been worked a lot. And so you can kind of see here our soil is not that black, rich, fertile soil that we see in a lot of the pretty pictures of farms. Um, it's been worked to the point of exhaustion. So we have a lot of work to do to start again um, to uh, farm in an agricultural setting. And so the things that disrupted that would have been land loss, like my people were displaced from New York to Wisconsin. Um, it would have been the disruption of cultural teachings being passed through, and that would have been through the boarding school era. And then it would have been, <clears throat> excuse me, it would have been further land loss once we were in Wisconsin. We actually lost 95% of our reservation um, due to the Dawes Act and the impact that that had in the mid uh, 20th century. So we're lucky, we're very lucky that we had seeds to start growing with, given all of those disruptions, all of those things that happened. Um, our ancestors knew the importance and the value of our seeds. 
They connected that value with our identity as a people. And so they carried those seeds with them from New York to Wisconsin. They got to Wisconsin in the early 1800s. It was freezing cold here. They had to make a choice on whether or not to eat all of those seeds that year or to save them so that we would have seeds as many generations in the future. And they chose to save those seeds. And so we really honor them, that original choice. We honor all of the people who made that choice year after year ever since then so that we could continue to have a relationship with our seeds, um, which really are part of our identity and our creation. Um, and we're just starting out growing seeds as a co-op. Um, we see ourselves as kind of budding up like this corn is budding up. Um, but we remember and we know that we're not um, we're not creating this idea. This is nothing new. Um, we're just picking up our responsibilities and carrying them forward as past generations did. So we were not always a co-op. We used to just grow in our backyards. Um, and that was something that was very difficult. Our backyards would get wiped out by raccoons in one night, all the corn would be gone. Um, and so we decided we would get together and we would try to grow as a group. Um, we got a little grant from Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education, which is a regional um, organization that you'll hear more about on Thursday. And the little grant was to study how fish emulsion worked uh, as a fertilizer on our corn. Um, and so fish used to be buried in the mound system with the corn, beans, and squash as a fertilizer. We don't bury the fish anymore, but we thought there's this new thing called fish emulsion. We could spray it on the corn and perhaps it'll be a modern application of a traditional practice. So we invited everybody from the reservation to come and join and learn about um, soil health with us at a workshop in 2015, 2016. And um, 50 people came out, which was really surprising. And then after that event, we asked if anybody wanted to grow corn together and 10 families stayed. And that uh, picture in the top left, those are the folks that stayed on and said, all right, let's try this. Let's grow together the way our ancestors did. Let's grow communally um, and let's try to um, just pick up those responsibilities and see what happens when we do that. And we integrate our cultural teachings with the tools that we have available today. And it was a pretty great success. So you can see this is my dad out here standing in the cornfield. He's just couldn't be happier that the corn is that tall. Um, and we grow the white corn that's there in the middle of the left picture. We also have dozens of other Haudenosaunee varieties that we could be growing. Um, the white corn is sort of like the bread and butter variety that we grow. It's a flint corn, which means that once you grow it, you have to dry it out. So we braid it up into those braids that you see and we hang it up over winter. And then you have to shell it and then you cook it with hardwood ashes and you boil that for several hours and then you can make a bowl of soup. So it is the slowest food ever. Um, we maybe also invented the slow food movement. <laughs> so um, every year that we've, we've done this, we've folded in more of our traditional practices and teachings as they kind of come to us from our elders and friends. So some of those teachings are learning our language, making sure that we're introducing ourselves in our language at each of our meetings and doing language lessons. Uh, we give thanks through ceremony and then we also do a tobacco burning at the field before we plant to acknowledge that we're stepping into our responsibilities and just asking the seeds to carry on their responsibilities to acknowledge the land and to acknowledge the water, the wind, all of the things that all the beings that come together to make sure that there's uh, we continue to live in abundance together. Um, we also soak our corn seeds in medicines, plant medicines before planting, and that helps them germinate and keeps the insects and birds off of them. We sing our songs to the corn as we plant them. We hand plant with the children, which is really beautiful um, to participate in. Um, and then we hand pick and braid the corn at the end, um, and I'll get to that. So this is the plant that we harvest to soak our seeds in. This is something that one of our relatives be on the field that we've connected with through this process. And then that's my mom there holding a big black ash harvesting basket. So it has straps on it. You can wear it like a backpack. And as you're picking corn, you just throw your corn right into the basket. So these are the relatives that we've gotten to know, the black ash trees and the mayapple. Um, as part of getting to know our corn and renewing that relationship and that treaty with the seeds. So that's been a really beautiful uh, thing to come out of that as well. 
Um, the biggest resiliency practice, aside from uh, knowing our seeds and planting our seeds, is just cooperating with one another to do something together. Um, so we have learned how to work together. Um, we've loved working together and getting to know each other as we kind of reconnect to our teachings. Um, and we usually have two or three generations in the barn or in the field at a time. So there's a lot of intergenerational teachings being passed down. And that's fixing that gap that we have that the 100 plus years of boarding school imposed upon our people when they tried to disconnect our teachings from ourselves um, and place shame of being indigenous onto us. Um, and so we're breaking that shame. We're reconnecting to our elders and our youth back together. Um, and it's having a really profound effect on the youth who feel much more grounded and much more proud of who they are, proud of their identity and proud to share about that. So even though it seems like they're just running around and playing and maybe not helping as much, it's amazing to see them turn around an event and speak and speak so eloquently about how important the corn is to them and how important it is that they're connected to those um, cultural teachings and to their elders. So we um, really prioritize that. It allows us to bring everybody's gifts into the circle. Excuse me. And every year that circle grows. So we have <clears throat> new members that join the co-op and we call those under the wingers. So we'll nominate somebody to kind of come under my wing for a year learn everything, and then we'll decide, is this person harmonized with the group? Can this person maintain a good mind in the field and in the barn? Which means that you are maintaining peace, um, you are um, operating with honesty, and, um, and um, you are uplifting those around you. So you're using encouraging words. So there's a lot of elements of the good mind, which is part of our traditional teachings. Um, and we really try to maintain that, especially around the seeds, because the seeds really are children. They're the, they're the children that grow into being the corn. Um, and so we try to maintain that good mind. Plus, we're going to eat the corn. So we want to make sure that we're having a positive mindset, a positive spirit around the corn, because all of that is going to eventually come back into us. Now, we've also had to adapt quite a bit, so it has not all been uh, sunshine and roses since we got started. We decided to start farming in a very tumultuous time, uh, speaking from the climate perspective. So anybody who was born after 1985 has actually never experienced a colder than average year. And so that is very challenging um, because every year we have seemingly a new unprecedented weather event or climate event. So this is the year that we had those huge rains in 2019 all across the Midwest. There was a lot of damage that happened because of those rains. And for us, we lost 90% of what we planted because our fields were so flooded. Now, it didn't help that our soils were very unhealthy from being farmed over and over and over again without that original teaching of rotation. So what we've done is we do now uh, crop rotation throughout our fields and we'll do several years of cover crops before we come back in and plant our corn. So it's been all over the place. Our best year we had 10,000 pounds of corn that we harvested. Our worst year we had 1,000 pounds. And so to adapt to all of these changes and to help regenerate our soil, we're looking to our ancestors for direction and then we're also working together to move forward. So this is some a one way that we're picking up the teachings. On the left, this is some an, very, very old ancestral uh, agriculture mounds that are in Wisconsin that are Menominee or ancestors of the Menominee people. Um, and these are thousands of years old, these mounds. And so when you look at what we're starting to do to adapt, which is use this hiller system, this is that same field that you just saw, to help lift the soil out of the water, it's a very similar practice. So again, a lot of our uh, new ideas and advances in technology for agriculture are really our indigenous teachings coming back around to teach us a lesson. This is a picture of our cover crop uh, field that we have, or one of our cover crop fields. These are all the benefits of adding cover crops. So basically cover crops build the soil back up. Every time you come in and plow the soil, you're degrading the soil's quality, you're kind of making it less spongy, less able to hold nutrients, less able to infiltrate water. 
And when you keep a living cover on the soil, you keep living roots in the soil, it gives an opportunity for that soil to rebuild itself. So all the life that lives in the soil will build you back more soil year after year. And of course, this calls back to our village rotation where we, we can't pick up our whole reservation and move it every couple of decades anymore, but we can rotate our, through our fields and that's what we're doing. We've also started um, researching intercropping. So we'll come in and plant our corn and then we'll come in after the corn comes up and we'll put in a clover, uh, maybe a winter rye, which if you plant in the summer, it doesn't get very big. Um, or uh, chicory is something that we're um, researching right now and um, plantain. And we're actually looking at researching that with another sustainable agriculture research and education grant, which is the one that got us started. Um, and we're looking at, you know, how do these cover crops impact the soil? How do they bring in pollinators? How do they suppress weeds? How do they fix nitrogen so the corn can have something to eat when she grows? And we're also looking at no-till. So last fall, we planted an aristic rye. This spring, we're going to come in and roller crimp that down, which basically just is like steamrolling it. You can see the conservation or the, the roller crimper coming over in the front. On the back of that tractor would be a conservation planter that would open up that mat of um, aristic rye, drop the seed in, and then cover it back up. So that's something that we're going to be experimenting with this year. And in this process, we're not even disturbing the soil at all. So we have not turned the soil over. We haven't exposed all those bacteria to the air. We're maintaining the integrity of the soil um, from year to year and, and building it up. So that, that's something that we're really looking forward to doing. And that'll make us more resilient as the climate continues to chaotically serve us drought or floods from year to year. Um, so OK Logu is um, a volunteer cooperative. Nobody gets paid. Nobody sells their corn. It's just for sustenance. Um, or we as a co-op don't sell our corn. Individual members might sell a bit of corn here and there um, as uh, processed corn. So we don't sell our seeds, but we might sell corn soup or we might sell dehydrated corn as a food. Um, but the seeds are sacred, so we do not sell the seeds. Um, and this is some of the relationships that we've made along the way. Oneida Nation has actually changed the policy on accessing land. So if you're a group of Oneida people that want to grow some traditional Oneida foods, you can get a free lease on some agricultural land in Oneida. Um, and that's as a result of working with us as a co-op um, because we weren't able to afford the land leases around here. And so they changed the policy. Um, and so now new co-ops are getting started in Oneida, which is very exciting. Um, there's SARE. This is our first partner and our continuing partner that's provided us grant funds to do our research projects. Braiding the Sacred has helped us bring people out during harvest so that we can teach them about the farm and then also teach people about our culture and our corn. And, um, and it really helps us out to have that many extra hands on site for the harvest time. And then Intertribal Agriculture Council and the Great Lakes Commission have also been great partners for us. So those relationships really come in handy at harvest time. We pick all of our corn by hand. We usually plant four to six acres. That's a lot of corn to pick by hand. If you've never picked corn by hand, trust me, it's a lot. It's usually about 400 hours that we put into each acre to pick it, um, harvest it and put it up. So there's my dad picking some corn. There it is all um, braided and hanging up in the barn with the little pie tins to keep the mice off of it. And then there's Pam driving the tractor um, to mulch the corn and keep that down as a cover over the fall to help the soil rebuild. This is uh, something that has taught us a lot about our own teachings. Every year we seem to learn something new from elders, from faith keepers, from clan mothers who um, have carried on the tradition of that traditional system of leadership. Um, and so we learn something every year and something that's really come in handy with a big co-op of people, it's consensus and mediation. So we use our traditional methods of mediating um, and reaching consensus. And that's really helped us uh, keep a good mind and just remember that, um, you know, we're just, we're following our ways and our responsibilities. It's not always easy to work with other people, but it really helps us um, stay grounded in what we're doing. We save uh, all of our foods and store them away, of course, this is a beautiful pantry. Not everybody's pantry looks like this. This is my cousin Becky's pantry. Um, but you can see she has a lot of corn in there and a lot of other traditional foods like beans, maple syrup, and things like that. 
We save our seeds from year to year and we take yearly climate notes to keep track of how the seeds are resilient um, to different climactic patterns and we're diversifying the varieties of Haudenosaunee corns that we're growing. It's helped us um, barter and make relationships with other tribal nations. So this is one of the barter markets that we've held in Oneida um, and they seem to grow every year. It's a really beautiful event um, and we've traded with um, let's see the Senecas for buffalo. We've traded with wild rice with the Ojibwe people. Um, we've just made we've reconnected a lot of these trade routes. And this this trade route map might look really familiar to you because our interstate system basically lays right on top of this. So these were the trade routes that were in place prior to European uh, contact. Um, and you can see how vast they are and how a lot of them follow river systems. Um, and and there are amazing uh, digs that turn up um, cacao or turn up um, all kinds of different um, pottery and metals from across the Americas right in our home territories and Haudenosaunee lands. So um, the trade uh, system, the trade ec economy was not something that was brought to the Americas. This was something that very much is part of our agricultural legacy and something that we are remembering and something that we're picking up as well. Speaking of remembering, there's a lot of things that we need to remember when we grow our traditional foods. I really love this pyramid because it connects the eating part, which was the relationship that we had before we started growing corn together, was just the spoon to mouth relationship, all the way down through cooking, preserving, harvesting, and that goes to harvesting the mayapple, harvesting the black ash, tool making, so making those baskets, and then the teachings that underpin all of that, so the honorable harvest remembering to have a good mind, et cetera. So um, we know that we are going to expect more hardship and more uh, climate chaos as we move forward. We know there's gonna be other disruptions, um, but we're gonna make sure that we hold on to that story of resilience that we have in our DNA. Um, and we're gonna plan to grow the co-op to 50 families eventually. We have 15 that are part of Ohilagu now and we're just getting uh, going to plan how we're gonna plant this year. It's a very exciting time of year. Um, and I just, the thing that I wanna leave you with is that the relationships that we build with uh, the fellow Ungwehue, our neighbors, the local county even is helping us out with our research project, and then all of our plant and animal relatives, that's really our not so secret um, ingredient to our, our adaptation and our resilience. So I hope that I gave you a little bit of insight into indigenous agriculture. Um, we are Oneida, but we're not in the Yuset region anymore, but we are of course from there. Um, and there is an Oneida nation in the Yuset region as well. Um, and there are other Haudenosaunee nations that have farms. And actually the next speaker is from, from another one of those farms from the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. So I'll say Yamanko, thank you and I will hand it off to Wally Ransom. Hello? Hi, Wally. Hi. Okay, I'm a little new at this, so. Uh, I, I guess I'm just gonna, we started in 2016 and started as a pilot program. Uh, so we had two years to, I say, to make, to start something. So what we thought was, um, let's see. Looking for my presentation. Not finding it. So, with, with the two year uh, pilot program, we, you know, it was seemed limited what we could do, but we came up with the idea of um, working with students. And uh, wait, I got a friend. There we go. Okay, can everybody see this?
Okay. You can hear me, right? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you okay. and we can see your presentation. Okay. Okay. So, uh, yeah, in 2016, we wanted to we wanted to start something here, and really, what when I started, uh, our tribal council wanted they wanted to start farming activities on our reservation. So I thought about getting a bunch of students together and in the late winter, spring of the year, we had we started out with 10 students, we ended up with nine, but we went through a series of workshops and they learned about egg production. They learned about chickens, uh, feeding them diseases, raising them, housing them, we learned about egg processing, you know, food safety with all of that. So they went through this course in the springtime and when they were out on summer break, we got them together and we went to each, each, we kind of did, we did it as a group. We went to each student's house and we did like a mini barn raising where we built a chicken coop at each one of the students' homes in their backyards, put up a chicken coop with fencing and we provided them with, they got about, about 80 chickens each. And we, we provided them the feed and all of the materials that they needed to take care of the chickens. And they, they took care of the chickens, they collected the eggs and every day we drove by to all of the sites and collected the eggs. And when we did that, we inspected, you know, we looked at we looked to see how well they were taking care of the chickens. You know, we had a checklist. There was 10 items that we looked at, whether they were fed, was the chicken coop clean, and they got graded. Every time we picked up the eggs, we had this little score sheet where we graded them on how well they were doing. So we collected the eggs, we brought them in, we washed them, we packaged them, uh, and we started selling them in local stores. So we were getting money, revenues from this. and. Each month, the, the revenues that it brought in, we went back to those score sheets and we, we, uh, we developed this share. Uh, they earn shares towards, towards the monthly revenue. So the more shares that they earn based on their, how well they took care of their chickens, the more money they got each month. So it was a reflection of, you know, how much effort they put into it. They did, we, did, we didn't just take all the money and split it nine ways. You know, it, it got proportion to how well they scored with the taking care of their chickens. So it, this was a good idea because we were just starting out and it was real easy to promote this. There was students and those nine students there, they're from nine families. Those families, they talk to one another. Word of mouth was really big with, with this. And, and it, uh, when we started selling them in the stores, uh, it, it went over real well. And we first started selling them in December of 2016 was when they went on the shelves. And we had the chickens and they, they lay for about a year. So this, you know, when they went through, when the chickens were, had went through their first season of laying, and then that following year, some of these students were seniors. So they were graduating and they were starting other plans. So. And then the other thing was that we were a pilot program. We didn't know whether our funding was going to continue. So we just saw that this effort kind of came uh, not to an end, but it, 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 it ran its course. And the students, they learned, we didn't see where we could teach them anything new. So we offered the students, they can keep the chickens, they can return them, they can keep the coop or return it. And they all did different things with it. Uh, so that kind of came to an end. Um, at least we didn't have eggs in the stores anymore. But as soon as that happened, it was like uh, we got a lot of negative feedback and it was like, where's the eggs? You know, everybody had gotten used to these eggs. They liked them uh, and they weren't on the shelves anymore. And at this, around the same time, we became a permanent program. So we, we looked at putting the eggs back on the shelves and when we did it with the students, it took up about 90% of our time. There was three of us, myself and two laborers. It was about 90% of our time uh, working with the egg program. So we thought in order to put the eggs back on the market, if we had one uh, chicken coop on our property and we um, took care of them ourselves, it would be a lot more efficient with labor. 
So we started, and this is in April of 2018, I believe. And this was the day before we got chickens, the day before we got 400 chickens. And uh, um, I don't know if you can see, they're putting texture 111 on the back here. And they worked this day and the next day I went to get the chickens that we had a tarp over the top. We just made it, we got the chickens in here and uh, we got started. And we finished, we ended up finishing and painting the chicken coop the, uh, the following summer. And we're a real new program, you know, this, so this is our uh, OSHA approved scaffolding. And I say that we, we have on our, our uh, camouflage uh, harnesses, um, but we got the, the chicken coop done and we, we buy our chickens, they're pullets, they're 20 weeks old and they're about a three hour drive away to get them. So we have this dump trailer that we built this uh, top on it. And this is, I think there's, in this one, there's only about 250 birds in this one because now we buy them, we stagger them. We don't buy them all once. We buy a spring flock and then we buy another one in the fall. Um, and right now we're up to just about 650 birds. Uh, but this is how we get them. We drive down and we bring them back like this and then we hand, uh, catch them all by hand and put them into the coop. Uh, our chickens are raised on pasture. And this is a spring picture. This is when they first went out there and it's, uh, you know, she's the spring chicken right here, right? And, you know, I heard about, uh, we're raising quite a lot more, like I raised chickens for a while, but I, I got, you know, a dozen or so at home. It's, but now we got a couple hundred birds and it's a little bit different. And, you know, I, I know that chickens forage, but this is the spring picture. And this is the same, this is the same, uh, just different angle, but this is what it looked like in the fall. After these birds, they, they uh, foraged all of this and we ended up having to expand the fence because they just completely ate all the grass. They made these these here in the summertime. They uh, they laid here and they sunbathe. This is just after a rain, so it's kind of it's wet here. But the eggs we we have these nesting boxes. The one on the left here, the, the chickens go in behind this curtain. They lay the eggs, and then the, when they as soon as they stand up, the egg rolls in and it collects them into this uh, compartment here. So to access the eggs, you lift up the, this uh, roosting board and you open up this metal uh, lid and all the eggs are here. The chickens aren't able to, uh, to eat them or peck on them or poop on them, you know? Um, so we collect the eggs here and they're stored and we, until they're washed, we, we wash our eggs once a week. So they can sit at room temperature like this uh, when, they're, when they're born. And I think they call it a, uh, there's a name for it, but when the, chick, when the egg is laid, it's actually wet. And when it dries, it forms this membrane. It seals the shell on the egg. They actually don't need to be refrigerated. But USDA requirements are that uh, any eggs that you retail have to be washed. So once you wash these eggs, they need to be refrigerated because you're taking off that seal around the, the shell and, and the, the egg shell is porous. So, so we wash the egg and this is, a, this is just a, it's just pretty simple. It's just, it's okay. just about so 9, 10, 11. And, uh, I don't know how so yeah, this, this has a heating element in it and it holds the water. I think it's around 110 degrees. And then we use a chlorinated detergent in here and the eggs are immersed in here. There's an impeller on this motor. So it's like a whirlpool in here. For three minutes, the eggs are in the uh, wash water. We bring them out of the wash over there and then we hand rinse them and put them on these racks. And then there's the racks that they, they've dried since they've been rinsed. They're candled here. This is an egg on here. And when you put them over this light, you can identify any cracks. So you can't sell eggs that are cracked. So they go from there and then they're put into the cartons. And the cartons are, there's, there's, 20 dozen in each of these boxes. And you know, we're, we're a young, new organization. So we take advantage of everything that's uh, free or available. And these boxes, we had a whole bunch of these boxes that were available. We didn't have to pay anything for them. So, um, 
and it's kind of typical of a, it's a res box. We know what it's used for, right? So, uh, this is what our eggs, like I said, when, when the student program ran its course and we were, uh, we stopped supplying for, I want to say it was about three or four months. We didn't have eggs in the stores. And when we came back with our own uh, birds and all of that, we had this little campaign, they're back. This is what they, our eggs look like in the store. And we have, let's see, we're producing uh, about 250 to 300 dozen a week of eggs. And we have nine stores in our community, mostly convenience stores that sell our eggs. And there's two stores off of our reserve that's, that carry our eggs. And every year the demand grows slightly and slightly. So we adjust how many birds we get based on the demand. Um, in 2018, we started raising pigs. This is the first batch we bought. There's 14 of them. We bought them from a local uh, a community member that, that was raising pigs. She had two litters. We bought both litters. And in the center here is Lulu. And I'll, I'll talk about her a little bit later. And this is her sister, Oreo. Uh, but our idea with this was we would get these pigs and we would raise them up to market weight. We would sell them, uh, technically we're selling them as a live pig. We sell them as a half pig. Community members can buy them. And once they're, they're sold, when they're ready for market, we, we transport them to the processor and the, the community member pays the processing fee. So when, it, when everything is done, the community member just goes to the processor and picks up their meat when it's ready. Uh, and this went over real well when we, when we advertised it. And um, I don't remember how long it was, but it was less than an hour that when we offered them up for sale that they all sold. And we, um, it's been a pretty popular program. The pigs are, we raise them on pasture and it, when they're out like this, see these pigs in here, they're, they're, they're content, they're happy, they can move around. Um, and I think that's part of growing a good product is having a healthy product. Uh, these animals, they're in, their, they're in their closest to their natural environment and they're able to root in there. They're designed to be rooting and digging in the soil. They, they, they get a lot of things in the soil and in the plants they eat. Um, but we do have, it, it's a corn based feed that they have. And um, we raise them on in these past, this is a drone shot. This is our barn. And this is in 2020, the spring of when the pandemic hit. And we got, we got a big, funny, we got, uh, because of the, you know, there was a fear of shortages, food shortages and all of that. Our, our tribe invested in our farm. And if you can see here, we got a water line put in. This is the running the water line along the road here. These are the water line pipes. Um, and this year, these pens that we have, they're roughly 100 by 100. And these ones we're just building. These haven't been occupied yet. These are the ones that their pigs are in. They're in these houses. And say so we're building them in our staging area, and these are fencing panels that we make. These are uh, because we didn't have electricity out here. These are all panels made out of rough lumber with wire on them, and we, we just put them into place and we brace them up. Um, but that year, the pandemic in 2020, we raised 120 pigs on our farm, and we had 10 of these 10 of these uh, pens, and we had a 12 pigs in each pen. We have these here, these are, this is our spring pig. So we have them, we had 10 pens all in a row along the road here for the spring. And then what we did that following winter is we took these panels and we flopped them over so that the fence was right close to the road. They were easier to take care of in the winter, not having to go through the snow. Um, these are one of the houses that they are in. They're outside and all year round, winter and summer and even in the muddiest conditions and all of that, you keep dr nice, clean, dry bedding in their house and they stay clean. Uh, and one of the, you know, we came around that size and the numbers thing is that uh, this, these pens are eight foot by 16. We, we make them out of rough cut lumber that we buy locally. 
we make them on these skids underneath our trees that we cut down on the farm. Um, but when you get to actually like 12 is 12 pigs in here is a lot of pigs. And when you get bigger, they get crowded. They, they actually pile, will pile on top of one another if they're too crowded. Um, but we think we got it to where, you know, we try to keep it between 10 and 12 in one of these houses. And this is uh, 13 pigs that went to market uh, January 31st of this year. And this is our brand new trailer. This is the first load we took in it. Uh, this was made available through ARPA money. Uh, another COVID boost to our program, I guess. Um, this is one pig, what it, what it yields. And we've got here breakfast sausage, links. This is breakfast sausage bulk, Italian sausage, pork chops, uh, ribs. You have smoked hams, roast steaks, uh, pork hocks for corn soup, and bacon. And we raised them, they, they, to about 240 pounds live weight. They dress between 170 and 180 pounds. So a half of a pig, uh, a homeowner gets about 85 to 90 pounds of, of pork products. And this is uh, the finished product. And remember Lulu, um, this is her now. She's a, she's a, uh, a sow on our farm. She has litters and her sister, Oreo, if you remember, Oreo used to look like this. I don't have a uh, uh, adult picture of Oreo, but they're, they're sisters and they were bred at the same time. They had their, this litter, they had, I wanna say they had them less than 12 hours apart, the litters, but Oreo was a, not a good mother. She didn't pay attention to her pigs. She sat. She sat on one, she was careless. And it like we had to do something because it looked like she wasn't gonna take care of the pigs. So they were so close in age, they were sisters. We took all of Oreo's piglets and we put them in with Lulu. And she, the, the, these, some of these are her, her kids and some are her, uh, I guess her nieces and nephews. But we're real proud of Lulu. She took, I, I don't remember how many she had in here. You can probably call them, but she, she had just enough teats to feed all these pigs. And in 2018, when we became a permanent program, uh, we looked at some tribal property that we could start something with. And this is what we started with. This was, uh, a, this was actually was a farm that um, stopped being a farm in the eighties. So for all these years, it's just sat fallow. And a lot of this weeds, brush and trees, uh, this is what we had to start with on the farm. And I believe that anything that you do with agriculture starts with this, the soil. And we're kind of blessed on this farm. We have a good soil here. It's a stony loam. There's stones in there that make it difficult sometimes, but the soil is pretty good. Uh, the only issues we had, um, you know, we had brush and trees on it and it's somewhat poorly drained. And it's really the, the limiting factor to this soil. So what we did was, uh, Oh, actually started in 2020 was we started tile drain. We put um, underground, they're four, spaced 40 feet apart. They're perforated, uh, four inch perforated drain tile. Um, that's, that's, it's underground on a slope and, and it, it takes groundwater and it drains it away from the, from the, the soil. And this is, uh, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but this is, I'm plowing under our crop of uh, winter rye right here. And we farm organically. We don't use uh, commercial fertilizers or herbicides. So we rely on um, crop rotations, green manures. We use chicken manure. And we were doing some composting for a while. Uh, we use organic fertilizers. And this is buckwheat. And I used to, you know, I heard about this buckwheat I learned about it in school and they talk about, I knew it was a green manure and you plow it under, it adds nitrogen, but they talked about how it chokes out weeds. And it wasn't until I grew this crop that uh, I believe it. When we seeded this, you seed anything and there was mustard coming up, lamb's quarters, red root pigweed. It all came up with the buckwheat. 
But after a couple of weeks, nothing else survived. This is buckwheat and, and it's thick. Huh? And my daughter took this picture and she says uh, that uh, I'm out standing in my field. So the other thing that we grow is winter rye. And after the buckwheat crop, we'll put in, uh, we usually plant this by the 15th of September and it grows, this is about as much as it's gonna grow in the fall. It goes, and it needs to grow through a winter cycle for it to um, produce seed. And sometimes we don't quite get it in by the 15th of September. Sometimes it's a little later, but this still survived this crop, this winter rye. Um, and you can do, sometimes we plow it under in the spring and, and plant another, um, plant a, a row crop or so, or we can let it mature. And this is rye when you, when you let it grow. This plant is uh, five foot three and a half inches tall. It can be, you can let it go to maturity and you can harvest the seed to plant the next year, but we don't really have the, the machinery to do that. So we take ours and we, we mow it down and we bale it into straw. We use the straw for bedding for the pigs and we use it for mulch in our garden. Uh, speaking of garden, in 2019, we actually were asked by the casino if we could produce uh, some vegetables for them. So we sat down with their food and beverage people. We looked at, they gave us their actual uh, purchasing list of what they buy for their uh, food venues. And we looked at the list and we looked what we thought we could produce. And we put in a quarter acre of uh, tomatoes, eggplant, uh, summer squash, zucchini, jalapeno peppers, bell peppers, uh, and it worked out well for us. Everything we produce, they bought all of it. Every, I think it was once and sometimes twice a week, we package everything up and it worked out real well for us. Uh, that was in 18, so uh, 19, yeah. So the following year, this is what we expanded to. This was land that we had cleared on the farm and, um, we just, we just went, we're about, in this picture, we were a little over an acre here. There's my outstanding buckwheat there before it flowered. Um, but this is our vegetable garden. Um, and we're, we're up to almost, not quite two acres with our vegetables now. And they're sold at uh, a local farmer's market. And this is our stand that we have there. Uh, and this has worked out really well. One of the things that this really did for us is, you know, people see the eggs in the stores and they, they bought the uh, pork products from us. But when we got this farm stand, we, we, we saw our customers face to face. We interact with the customers. They, they could ask us questions about the farm and things. And the other thing that this gave us an opportunity was there's a program in our community, uh, Seven Dancers Coalition, and they were trying to, to make healthy foods accessible and we got with them and they had money where we, we developed this coupon program where we produced coupons and they bought, they paid us, they like prepaid for the vegetables and they have a network where they they got these coupons out to members of the community. So I think each, they were $15. So community members got this coupon, they could come out and get $15 worth of vegetables and they didn't have to pay for them, but it gave us an opportunity to see these people and to get, you know, our vegetables into their homes. Uh, another crop that we grow, and it's really, uh, like we started out with an acre. This, here, this is a corn planter, and, and we grow Iroquois white corn. And we started out with an acre, and we borrowed equipment, and uh, the next year it was two acres and then four acres. And this last year we grew eight acres. So we doubled every year and we, we got new, uh, we've been able to get some equipment over the years. But this is our corn planter. Uh, like I said, we used, we crop rotate, we use green manures, cover crops, but we also uh, in the corn planter in this, in the, these are fertilizer bins. And what we use in here is dried chicken manure. So that runs, that 
that goes in with the, the corn. Um, we cultivate with a, a cultivator behind a tractor. And um, this is the corn when it tasseled. This is the eight acres that we grew. Uh, and you can kind of see, we had to clear this land. So there's some areas where, like where this tree is, there's rocks around there. Um, and there's spots where we, you know, try to make it the best shape that we can to use the land. There's another tree that we left in with rocks around it. And, um, but you can see here, right here where my hand is, this thing, there's a ditch that goes in between here. This is what our tile drain drains into. And it slopes down the hill this way. So at this part, this part of the field right here, there wasn't enough depth in the ditch to tile drain this. So you can see the difference. We, we, we couldn't grow corn here. This was too wet to plant any corn on, but this is where we were able to grow our white corn. And like I said, we really evolved a lot with the white corn and we did, we started out doing a lot of stuff like hand by hand, like the way Leah talks, but to put in eight, there's no way we could have done this by hand, eight acres. So uh, we got the help this past year, we harvested with a combine. And this is, we, we hired a combine to harvest our corn. There's our field. Um, and off the eight acres, we got about, we got eight tons of corn or 16,000 pounds. And what was, it was a big jump this year because uh, it was a lot different. See this corn, this is the, the corn in the kernels right here in the field. And there's, there's moisture in here. It's, it's, there's too much moisture in to store this. So this had to be dried. But the guy that we worked at had a corn dryer. We dried it down to, uh, we dried it down to about between 11 and 12% moisture. And then the other thing, if you can see in here, there's piece, it's not a perfect, perfectly clean, there's pieces of cob, there's cracked kernels and all kinds of stuff in here. But the guy that we work with also has a seed cleaner. So he ran this through the cleaner and cleaned this all up. And um, we actually had a little bit more than, like I said, the eight tons because he pulled out a lot of the cracked kernels and things. And, and we ended up with eight tons or 16,000 pounds of, of clean corn off of our, our crop this year. And that's something that Personally, I'm really proud of that because it's, you know, like we, we, the other things that we did, the eggs, the pigs, the vegetables, they're things that, uh, you know, the resources to find help and all of that are all around, you know, but uh, the white corn, we're kind of in new territory, especially with, with the scale that we're doing it now. We're on a bigger scale. We're looking at mechan uh, machines to, to, to harvest and, and process our product. And it was, I was nervous in the fall because I didn't know how this was all gonna go. And we're, we're in the process of uh, marketing the corn right now with other uh, First Nations. And it looks like we're able to sell all of the corn at, at a really um, a good price. Um, but I think in the future, we're gonna, we put all our eggs in one basket this year with this combine, but after all the anxiety that I went with last fall, I think we're probably going to do a combination of uh, hand picking and we're going to purchase our own corn picker and put it in a crib. And then I don't want to, we're probably going to do some combining, but I think uh, what made it challenging is that our corn isn't bred to be mechanically harvested. Um, the, the ears, the ears don't um, see what what they. I don't know if you can see me on there or not, but a lot of the ears on our corn they they, they, they like stay erect on the stalk, and when it rains, uh, the it gathers on the ear, and and they breed corn nowadays so that the corn hangs down like that. It has a thin attachment, and and then our our corn doesn't mature all at the same time, so. We're in new territory, but um, it, not, a, not a whole lot of people do this. So it's like, um, I'm really proud of what we did with this. And, and with our program, I can talk about the, the successes that we've had. And it's because we've had a lot of help and support. 
these are uh, when we were doing things by hand. This is the uh, our uh, freedom school, uh, and it, it's a local school that uh, they're they're uh, they're taught our language and our culture uh, at a young age, all the way up to um, I think they go up to about grade six now. Um, they came out for a day and they helped us pick. And you know what was real? What I really liked about this is is like not so much out in the field here, but when we were husking this with the kids. All these kids were speaking Mohawk and it was so cool, you know. Another group that helped in our community, we have like uh, adults with special needs and there's a tribal program that, um, you know, they spend time, they have, uh, I don't know if they call them sponsors or, uh, but they, they spend time with them and they take them out and they take them visiting and all of that, but they brought them to us and we put them to work. And you know, uh, some of the people that work with them, they said that it was such a, they, they like working with us so much because they all, they're always entertained. They're take, taking places, they take them to the movies, they take them stuff and they're entertained by things, but they felt that they could, were contributing to something because they were working and they were producing something at the end. And I remember when they left, um, when they all walked out, they were shaking my hand and they were hugging me. <laughs> and uh, they were the best group that we had. When, when, they, when they were with us, we, we husked more corn than any other group that helped us out. Um, and we have nearby, there's a group of farmers that, you know, like I said, we build those huts and we use a lot of rough lumber. Well, these guys, they, um, a lot of them have their own sawmills and we buy lumber from them and they don't drive cars. They don't have electricity and phones and all those things. So there's times that we've helped them out with uh, trucking some things around. We have a good relationship with them. And when it came time to build our barn, 24 of them came out for the day and all we had to do was feed them lunch. But they came out and they worked uh, and they uh, put up the walls and the roof on our barn. And you know, they work in numbers and they don't have all of the modern tools. And it's really cool to see how they do things without electricity and all, you know, all of those luxury things, uh, but they work together and they do things like here, we would have had to hire a crane. You know, we would have spent money on all kinds of things, but they made their own boards out of that. And uh, they did it all. and. They just did it as a favor working with us. And we work with local, uh, I guess it's a justice program, but there's people in our community that for, for uh, you know, they, uh, you know, through the courts or whatever that they need community service hours to satisfy. So uh, we're set up good with a program and they bring people in and, and everybody that comes in is, you know, everybody has different um, skills and abilities, but we always find something for people that need community service to come in and, uh, and do. Uh, so with all of the, a lot of the help that we've gotten, it's, it's um, helped us get where we are. And the, another thing is that the work that we do is rewarding, you know, and we really feel like we're a part, a part of, um, the process and uh, the animals, we go out there and uh, this is my buddy. <laughs> uh, and it's, you know, things get hectic and you go out to the farm and you go out there and, and they come up to you and it, they're like pets. <laughs> um, but I ended up eating my pet here. <laughs> uh, but we're all about what we're producing food, you know, and um, good food and feeding people. So what we have, uh, um, our products, we call them, we, we have to label the Mother Earth products. And really what our goal was is, like I said, we want to get people doing agricultural things in our community. But the plan that we have is to establish this working farm that uh, once it's established and working good, that 
we're going to start bringing people out to the farm and we're going to start doing uh, courses, classes, workshops, internships where people can work hands on uh, and learn. Um, and then, you know, like a lot of the things, I think somebody, if they were going to either do pigs or chickens or something, there'd be a lot of questions and uh, worrying about, well, what if this, how much do I need, you know, but if they come out to the farm and, and they see how it's done and we know, okay, a pig is going to eat this much food. It's going to cost you this much. We're going to have all those answers, hopefully. And, and I know some people right now that grow pigs and they don't have a trailer to take them to the processor. You know, well, we have a trailer now, you know, but we're going to become, uh, we're going to start helping people in the community uh, to, um, to learn how to these farming practices. And this year we're planning our first course and it's going to be where we want to put on a tomato workshop, tomato course. I'm calling it a course. It's not a work. I don't call it a workshop because it's not a, you come in one day and you, you, you do your thing and you leave, but it's going to be a season long thing where it's going to be the, the people are going to come out to the farm. We're going to have a garden plot. We'll go plant the tomatoes. They're going to take ownership of a certain number of plants. We're going to have different people come in to talk about watering, pruning, pests, diseases. And in the end, we're going to have a canning workshop. And I'm hoping that, well, the experience that we have, it's going to be, it's going to be hands-on. And, and when they're done, I'm hoping that they can comfortably do the whole process on their own at home. Um, and we're looking at, we're working out the details still, but we think that, you know, when you offer something, there's an investment. If somebody invests in it, they usually they usually stick with it longer. So we're thinking that we're going to tack on some community service hours or, you know, in order to attend the, the tomato workshop, you have to spend so many, so much time with us feeding chickens, processing eggs, you know, working in our garden, that kind of thing. But um, that's what we look at for the future. And um, I don't know if I'm ran over on time, but thanks for listening to me. <laughs> Yeah, go Wally. That was awesome. And you're doing great on time. We're right on schedule, which is awesome. Um, so you all probably have questions for Wally. We're going to save the questions to the end. There's going to be a discussion section. Um, and I saw some of the questions in the chat, so I took note of those. You can keep throwing your questions in the chat. Um, otherwise, you can save them for the end and raise your hand and we'll do it that way. Um, so um, we had one presentation from Oneida, we had one presentation from St. Regis Mohawk tribe. Um, those are both northern uh, woodlands tribes. And now we're going to go south to Mississippi, to the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians. So I want to welcome uh, John Hendricks. He's the Director of Economic Development. And he's going to talk to you about Choctaw Fresh, which is the, um, the enterprise farm that they have at their tribal nation. So thank you, John, for joining us. Well, good morning, Lee, and everyone. Can you can you hear me okay and see my PowerPoint? Yes, sir. All right, excellent. Um, well, it's great to be with you. I certainly appreciate the invitation, um, and I'm impressed with the number of participants that you have. So that's uh, a good start to this virtual conference. Uh, good, again, good morning, everyone. My, my name is John Hendricks. I'm the Director of Economic Development for the Choctaws in Mississippi. And I'm going to share with you the story of the Choctaw Fresh Produce Enterprise and kind of the the Mississippi Choctaw's approach to the Food Sovereignty Initiative, the, the, the ups and downs and the, and the lessons that we've learned. Um, and I believe some of our um, uh, local community members are uh, participating in this and our, maybe our farm manager and local foods coordinator as well. So, so we do have some farming expertise. I'm not the farmer, I'm, I'm the economic developer, but we do have some folks on the call that can uh, help with uh, the, the farming expertise here. So. Um, let's jump in. So a little bit about Mississippi Choctaw, if you haven't been here, uh, it's the only tribe in the state of Mississippi. Um, the enrollment is a little over 11,000 members. There's 35,000 acres of, of, of trust land scattered around east, rural east central Mississippi, over eight communities. Uh, we have about 5,000 employees uh, with our tribal enterprises. So what I'll share with you this morning is the, the story of why and how Mississippi Choctaw established a food sovereignty initiative, um, kind of what it took to integrate 
fresh local foods into our larger food system. <clears throat> Uh, establishing a tribal organic farm operation, kind of what that took in our in our climate and in our geography and in the community, the efforts that we've taken to to expand nutrition education and get it into the FDIPRA program and the tribal school system, um, the different ways that we've tried to to get local food access, uh, make it more convenient to the community members, and then share some lessons learned out of our experiences. So. Hopefully this will be helpful to some of you. Um, so we'll start with why and how Mississippi Choctaw established the Food Sovereignty Initiative in the first place. Um, and I believe I heard Wally refer to this or Wallace refer to this a minute ago. So our story started in 2010 um, and the Casino Food, Food and Beverage Director requested that we consider growing fresh local produce. They were importing uh, fresh produce from all over the continent and he felt like surely there's a way for us to grow some of this locally. So that's where it, it first became an idea in our in our um, planning efforts. And then the next year, we were updating our five-year strategic plan, and we went out to all of the communities, and we're just doing some surveys and getting feedback on what were the most requested projects. And the, 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 the in quotes, community greenhouses were consistently ranked among the top five projects in all eight communities. So we felt like there was a a desire within the communities to actually um, expand our community you know, greenhouse programs and, and local foods initiatives. So we did, uh, again, similar to what um, the previous presenter mentioned, we did a market survey with our casino food and beverage department and said, well, wh what are you purchasing? And of that list, what could we actually grow in our climate? So we had a guy who ran our, our vocational rehab greenhouse program, a gentleman by the name of Dick Hoy, who had a, a career in agriculture and horticulture. And so we asked him to look at it and decide what, help us think through what we could grow in our community. And it added up to about a little over a quarter of a million dollars per year in purchases of the items that they, that they buy. Of course, it's seasonal and we can't do all of that year round, but that was kind of where we started with our homework. Um, and so we felt like when you, when you put all of the pieces to the puzzle on the table, it was consistent with the tribe's effort for self-determination. Um, there was potential to create some employment, uh, especially in our outlying rural communities. <clears throat> we did want to try to improve the health outcomes in the community, but uh, we uh, have a, a high rate of diabetes in, in the community. Um, we felt like it would potentially increase the awareness of the local food system. We've got about 80% of the students in the tribal school system on free or reduced meals. Um, we thought it could be a competitive advantage to our casinos to have locally sourced uh, fresh produce on, in their food outlets. Uh, we did have some unused uh, farming assets, some land and some equipment and a barn that we felt like could be put into production. Then of course, I'm the economic developer. So I was uh, hoping that this could turn into a, a new tribal business um, for the tribe's business portfolio. So. Uh, we started out by, I wrote an ANA grant um, in 2012 that was awarded. So that gave us our, our seed money, so to speak, to get this initiative going. So we received a, a, a grant for three years um, and ANA grants at that time could go up to 300,000 per year. So that's how we got our initial efforts um, funded. And so now I'll talk about the, the challenges of integrating fresh local foods into the large existing food system that we have. So for those of you who haven't visited the Choctaw community, um, the largest tourism attraction we have is the Pearl River Resort. So there's two casinos, over 1,500 hotel rooms, two golf courses, um, several food outlets, a water park, a recreational lake. And so there's a, a, a well-established resort that's been in existence since 1994. And, and lots of food goes through that um, all of their food outlets. So some of the, again, I, I mentioned that the casino food and beverage director was the first one who brought this idea up. Unfortunately, by the time he gave us the idea, by the time we got started, he, he moved on to a different position. So uh, we had to rebuild relationships and, and wanted to share some of those challenges with you just for your, for your knowledge. So one is our casinos spend about a million dollars a year on produce. Um, this number was probably pre COVID, but that was the benchmark that we were using internally. The chefs, at least in our area, love the high quality that Choctaw Fresh Produce delivers. They're 
certified organic, everything is um, uh, fresh, nutrient dense, gap certified, all of that. So the chefs love it. The challenge is that uh, small scale local foods can't compete on price. You've got these nationwide networks of large scale wholesale growers, suppliers, food systems. And even if you're growing at a mile down the road at a, at a community scale, it's hard to beat cheaper than the US foods and the Cisco's of, of the world. So um, the other challenge that we faced is that local egg production is seasonal, it's not year round. So if they're trying to serve blueberries on the buffet line in, in January, we're not able to deliver that. So they, it, it's just naturally that, the, that the, all the existing large food systems, they've got a network built out. That's why those networks exist. And it's hard to just plug yourself right into that um, without any hiccups. So the, the obviously the, the casino folks, the, you've got the chefs wanting it, but the budget folks and the procurement folks have a system that's set up to, to buy for the best value for the organization. And so, again, it's hard to just plug a, a new local food system into, into that uh, type of a network. So the bottom line is if you intend to grow fresh produce for your existing casino operations, you really need to get the key stakeholders committed to making it work because there's gonna be some ups and downs. It's gonna be different than what they're used to. And they're gonna to have to be a, a willing partner to make it work for everybody's best benefit. Also wanted to kind of share what it took to establish a tribal organic farming operation in um, on the Choctaw Reservation and in our geography and climate. <clears throat> so these are some pictures from our early methods. We use um, we started out with high tunnels. The the gentleman that that founded the organization, Dick Hoy, um, was convinced that high tunnels were the the, the best approach for our climate, um, and so. Part of our a a grant funded the build out of these high tunnels and so early on as, as well as a greenhouse so we grow everything from seed um, we do have a greenhouse this is our original greenhouse we've now added a new one this is a picture of some of our our high tunnels um, at that time we were using plastic we've now transitioned most of that over to um, fabric and no-till but they were getting the, the high tunnels ready for the, the season and then we in some areas, depending on where the farm was located, we needed to do some significant soil improvements. So it's, um, we spent a lot of time and effort and resources getting the, the soils ready to grow organically because the, to be able to grow organically, it's all about the, the health and quality of the soil and the, and the um, um, ability to grow naturally. Some, other pictures that we have here. So this just gives you a sense of kind of the, how we grow different types of crops. So in the winter seasons, especially, there's lots of leafy greens. Um, so you can see a high tunnel full of leafy greens. Um, in the bottom right, uh, that's a picture of Daphne Snow uh, putting, she's our farm manager, um, growing the tomatoes on the uh, stakes and in cages. We also use the advantage of growing vertically in the high tunnels for some crops like cucumbers and tomato berries where you can tie them on a, onto a trellis and you get um, 12 feet of growth vertically rather than growing horizontally across the ground. So you get a lot more production per square foot. And then again, in, in a, a few communities and a few tunnels, we had really poor soils. So we ended up um, putting in some um, raised beds with the uh, built-in irrigation and the and the covers to to minimize weed infestation. So those are just some pictures of that, and they have really been able to to figure it out in a lot of cases. So these are just some photos of the high quality uh, produce that they've been able to grow. These are leafy greens with uh, kale and romaine lettuce and um, chard. And we um, this was just a, a Facebook post from one of our wholesale customers just bragging about the. The quality. So they've done an excellent job of, of figuring out how to make this work. Um, just some more on the farm photos. Here's um, some tomato berries on the left, the, the showing the, the size and quality of the tomatoes that, that Daphne and the crew are able to grow up on the vines. And then that I believe the picture on the right was the harvest just from one tomato plant. So, so they've uh, again been able to get some really high good quality yields off of their crops. 
Another thing that we've really struggled with is, is finding people who want to be organic farmers, especially in the South and especially in the summertime. It's really hot, hard, um, hard work. And so we partnered um, with several of our workforce development programs. We have uh, on-the-job training, we have day labor, we have 90-day um, training program, we have vocational rehabilitation program. And so we, we partnered with all of them to, to find tribal members in the community that were, were interested in this type of work, wanted to be outside, wanted to work with their hands. Um, and so that really has worked well because you, um, th there's people who think they want to be organic farmers in the South and then there's, uh, but, but once they've done it or gone through a whole season, they may realize it's not for them. So, so we did experience some, some staff turnover, lots of staff turnover um, throughout the years. And so partnering with our workforce programs has been a, um, a real good fit for, for us. So we would encourage that. Um, <clears throat> also, we needed to do a lot of staff training. Um, people who, who like to farm or backyard garden, that's very different than being a commercial um, fresh produce operation. So. We made the decision to be certified organic. We didn't have any organic growers in our community. So lots of training needed to be provided around uh, organic production methods. Um, soils management, I mentioned that over the last 12 months or so, we've been transitioning to, to no-till. Um, so soils management is, is really one of the, the keys to being a success, successful organic farmer um, because the nutrition has to come from the soil into the plant. Uh, high tunnel production, again, that was new to our community. We didn't have people who were experienced in high tunnel production of fresh produce. And so we needed a lot of um, training and capacity building around that method. The, even though we're organic, you also have to get certified by EPA uh, worker protection. And so we had to um, have people trained in the application that were, uh, even though they were spraying organic um, uh, fertilizers or what have you, they still had to be EPA pass EPA tests and, and maintain the records for worker safety standards. Um, and then we also decided to become um, uh, GAP food safety certified. That was so we could supply our tribal school system. But again, uh, that's a new skill set that was more paperwork. So there's, there is a significant need to do staff training depending on how you approach your, your production. Um, another thing to be aware of if you're if you're growing fresh produce, especially in the south, is you once you harvest it, um, it immediately starts to decay in many cases. So you have to have a way to cool down a lot of the different crops that you're growing. Uh, this was one method that we used early on where you take a, a shed and you insulate it and you take a basically it's a room air conditioner, just a window unit air conditioner, and you can turbocharge it with a, an add on device here. Um, so just be aware that if you're doing fresh produce, uh, you've got to, many of those crops need to be cooled pretty quickly um, so that their shelf life gets extended. So today we, we have four separate farm sites. I mentioned that we have eight communities scattered out over rural East Central Mississippi. So four of those communities have farm sites. Um, we have 10 high tunnels of, that are 30 by 96, and we have <clears throat> about six tunnels that are around 30 by 145, some of them may be a little shorter than that, but that gives you a sense of, of scale. So it's about 1.3 acres of production under uh, plastic, under the high tunnel cover. We also have a, a packing house where they do the, the um, prepping, sorting and, and boxing and, and the on-site coolers. We have a, a greenhouse, this is the new greenhouse. So we have a heated and cooled greenhouse now with 30 by 75. Um, we have a mobile market where we can take fresh produce out to the communities or for um, other farmers markets and make it more accessible. We have six full-time employees and then we have some support staff from other departments like for bookkeeping services and, and payroll and things like that. So um, that's a snapshot of our current farming assets. And then we also have some intangible assets. I mentioned that we are USDA certified organic. Um, we have the GAP food safety certification. And then we also, again, we, we are now using the, the no-till approach, which is um, the best to improve the health of the soil. And we feel like it actually improves the, the nutrient uh, density of the produce that we're growing. So for every um, 
pound of squash you get, it's got more nutrients packed into it than, the, than what you may be buying from the grocery store. So um, the team is committed to that approach with uh, Daphne's leadership there. Um, now I'll talk a little bit about how we approach the nutrition education and integrating the fresh foods into our FDIPRA program at our tribal schools. So um, again, it's a, it's a rural community um, uh, and, and frankly organic around here just until recently probably just meant it sounded expensive. So um, we've had a lot of, of work and thoughtfulness around how do we increase the awareness of the benefits of organic and local. This is a picture of some of our um, uh, staff that have worked at Choctaw Fresh Produce and they're making a delivery to the food distribution program for Indian reservations. So some of you are probably aware that, that um, the dipper couldn't buy from tribal farms until very recently. Uh, they had to buy from DOD certified suppliers. So um, fortunately, our, we've got a good partnership with Fidipper now. They've gotten some grant funding and so they're able to buy some um, fresh produce directly from Choctaw Fresh to get it into their uh, FDIPR um, food programs. They also have uh, a very active nutrition education initiative. So, so they would um, take our produce and, and develop recipes and do taste tests with their FDIPR clients. And so that's just been a part of our community engagement and our education in, uh, around uh, the benefits of our local food system. We've gotten a farm to school grant, um, implementation grant. Uh, and so this is just some pictures of what we've done with that. So um, the bottom right, I, I guess just a, a practical reality in, in school kitchens is that the, the chefs in many cases are used to getting things that are already bagged and processed. And they just, they're, it's less time consuming to open a bag and pour it in the pot. So we had to do some um, convincing and education and training around um, actually being willing to process some of our produce. We, part of our farm to school grant, we got some funds to buy some equipment to help with that. So we can actually take chalked up fresh produce uh, and chop it up, bag it and freeze it. So that's a picture at the top right of our first delivery of uh, prepared and frozen product. Um, the school took, their initiative was to do like a, a, a food of the month so that the kids realized that that um, things don't grow year round. So they would feature something that was seasonal and, uh, coming from the farm and promote the benefits and nutrition and around that. And then that's just a picture of one of the students eating one of our blueberries. So, so it's, it was a, a, it takes a team effort. That's a lot of work to get all, the, all these um, pieces lined up to get local foods into your school system. But this is just a snapshot of some of the things that we did in the kitchen. And we also brought them out to the, to the farm. So um, we would bring kids out. This is pre-COVID, but that we would bring them out to the farm. They would get to tour. They would get to pick whatever they wanted. Um, Daphne would explain kind of what it took to grow um, organic produce in the community. And then our, our, uh, on the bottom right, our nutrition education group would have recipes and samples. And so almost across the board, kids would eat vegetables. Um, we kept hearing over and over that the, that the adults say that the kids won't eat vegetables, but but they will. Um, it just takes some time and effort and the right approach. So that's been a great um, experience and we look forward to getting back into that. We've also partnered with our high school um, trying to get kids interested in, in ag careers. So this is uh, our school has a career in ag professions program. So we've done farm tours and more intensive um, like internships and education curriculum around getting kids that think they want to maybe be farmers to, to learn and hands-on in our, in our uh, high tunnels. Um, we've done, this was a little while ago, but we actually did some cooking demonstrations because you realize a lot of people aren't used to um, buying whole fresh produce and then having to prepare a meal out of that. So we kept, we gathered some recipes and we did some demonstration videos just to try to uh, get people up the learning curve to understand, um, in many cases, how simple it can be and how enjoyable it can be to actually prepare your own meals from scratch. That's just um, a lot of people now are not used to that. They can buy it prepared already or processed or from a restaurant. So that was another thing that we did around uh, community education. Now I'll talk about how we 
tried the different things that we've tried to get um, improve access and make uh, the Choctaw fresh produce items more convenient and accessible to the community. First, um, a lot of this has been funded with um, grant partnerships. So uh, I mentioned that we got started with the a and grant. We've also worked uh, closely with First Nations Development Institute, Kellogg Foundation, uh, NCAT, uh, the Noyes Foundation, some other federal agencies. So very grateful for their financial support um, to, to add on different pieces to our food outlets um, uh, programs that I'm about to, to walk through with you. Um, We've, we've done retail uh, sales on the reservation and off the reservation. So on the reservation, we have a, um, a farmer's market uh, that is run by our, our natural resources program. There is a mobile market um, that we can take fresh produce out into the communities. We've done custom harvest programs, which I'll talk more about in the kiosk. And then off reservation, uh, retail wise, we've taken the mobile market off the reservation to sell at the um, farmers markets and busy intersections. Um, we also have done wholesale and institutional sales. So on the reservation, we supply the um, casino resort uh, restaurants, our Choctaw Health Center and the tribal schools. Off the reservation, we used to supply Whole Foods, uh, Rainbow Grocery, a uh, food hub that was in Jackson and off reservation schools. We're now focused on trying to keep all of our produce on the reservation. So I think most, most of the off reservation wholesale sales have, um, have gone away by our, by our choice, trying to keep the food in the community. Uh, we've also done uh, community supported agriculture, CSA or TSA, where you buy a subscription in a seasonal harvest. Uh, you pay that either weekly or upfront, but you'll get six or eight or nine weeks worth of um, a, a mixed box full of whatever is fresh from the farm that, that week. So we've done that with um, tribal members, employees that work for the tribe and uh, the residents in the area. We've also done a CSA program off the reservation in the state capital at, at Jackson. Um, so these are just some pictures of these initiatives. So this is a picture of our mobile market. So you see the, the van up front and then the market is, is pulled behind it. Um, and so this is an example of, we would take the mobile market to the to the employee entrance at the casino and it made it a lot more convenient for the employees to have access to the, the produce. Um, and they would stop on their lunch breaks or other breaks and just kind of stock up with what we had ready for the day. This is an example of a flyer that we've used for the custom harvest program. So we'll just send out an email blast to the um, people on the tribal email and put on, on social media and they can just call in what they want to to have harvested and we literally uh, like we'll, we'll send this out on a Wednesday we get our orders on a Wednesday the crew will harvest on a Thursday and they can come pick up um, what they've ordered just custom harvested right off the farm so that's something else we've tried um, <clears throat> I mentioned the subscription program so we've recently started referring to it as a TSA program a tribally supported ag program and so we actually um, sell subscriptions to the Tribal Elder Center Program and the Diabetes Prevention Program now, where they can get a kind of a guaranteed uh, like 25 cases per week for, for two months or so. And so that gives us some income for the, for the farm. And then they've got um, fresh produce to supply to their clients. We've also done um, seasonal markets where the, the the students in the Choctaw High School run the market. Um, so they do, they're responsible for the flyers, for the marketing, for getting everything set up, um, for staffing the booths and getting it all taken care of. So it's a good, uh, just a community outreach gets the kids involved and the, the kids are able to get their parents involved. So, so we've done that around um, uh, seasons like Thanksgiving and Christmas and, and other seasons around, uh, special events around that. We've also done a fresh produce kiosk program. This is actually an honor box system. Uh, so we would just set up a, a table inside the casino employee entrance where you have the most traffic and just an honor box. Here's what we have today. Here's what each price is. And then we have a little mailbox where they'll just leave their money. So again, it's just all about super convenience um, and the, the employees really appreciate that. And it's, it 
does it take as much labor to stop to staff the um, the market because it's just a volunteer program and we found that most people are honest and they really appreciate the convenience. Um, when it gets to things that we just can't sell, we don't want them to go to waste. So the, the, the crew will actually donate it to the elder center. So this is just an example of a donation. Um, uh, some things that were, were um, very ripe and needed to be um, distributed. So they were donated to the elders uh, center. And then we've also done in the past some at the end of the season, you have to swap out the crops. And so rather than let anything that's left go to waste, we'll do an end of season you pick. So it's just come and get it. There is no cost. Um, it's it's free to the community members. They can come stock up with what they can, can take and it saves us some labor on cleaning out these high tunnels. So it's a it's a win-win situation for, for everyone in that one in that case. And then if, obviously the COVID pandemic has changed lots of things for everybody's communities. Um, so one of the things that the fresh produce uh, crew did was they, they were actually, they, they had, you can imagine they, they, in January and February, they're planting their season, they're planting the seeds. And, and um, so all of that was planned before the pandemic even hit in March. And so by the time the, the, the crops were, were ready, um, they had to pivot and basically partnered with the tribe's administration um, to get food to the quarantined families. So the, the produce that they were planning to grow for the casinos, our casinos were closed, our schools were closed. And so they, they um, uh, formed a partnership to get that 4,000 pounds of produce out into the, into the families that were quarantined at home. So that was just another um, excellent effort by the, the, the team at the Fresh Produce Group um, who worked all the way through the pandemic and then the travel administration for partnering with them and getting that, don't let, not letting that food go to waste. Um, this is something uh, that we did just as an exercise. If, if you're thinking about tribal food sovereignty, what, what would it look like to be done? I mean, how much would you have to grow or supply to actually finish and be able to feed your community? So we just had a local ag economist who does a lot of grant writing for us, just kind of put together some rough numbers um, and so his approach was just to take some of the most common items that most households purchase on the, on the left and what's the average consumption in the United States, um, um, which would be the pounds per capita and what's the average yield per acre. So these, these were just rough numbers. This is not exact or perfect, but I, I just like the logic of, of this approach is what would it look like to be done or what would it take to be done? And then we took our population and then how many acres would we actually have to grow to, to, to meet that demand. He did the same thing with the um, livestock in terms of the typical items, beef, pork, chicken, turkey, et cetera, and figured out how many, what's the average um, uh, consumption per household? How many do you need? What's the, the yield of the dress weight per, per, um, per animal? And so the bottom line is we, he just gave us kind of a back of the envelope estimate of here's what it would look like to, to feed the whole community. Obviously there's, challenges with this in terms of price, in terms of acreage, in terms of seasonality, but we just thought, I thought it might be helpful to some of you to uh, just kind of think about what would it look like to actually be done and feed your, feed the, uh, the, the most common items for most of your community members. Um, a few lessons learned, and we've learned a lot. I mean, we've done, um, we, we've tried something new probably every season for the last uh, 11 or 12 years now. So, these are just a few of the highlights. Um, one is you definitely need a staff that enjoys commercial farming and is committed to long-term success. There's lots of ups and downs, lots of frustration. Um, it's you're subject to weather, you're subject to pests, you're subject to regulations and paperwork. Um, and it's not for everybody. So you definitely have to find the team that, that wants it to, to work and will make it work for the long-term. Um, small scale local foods can't compete on price and most cases, I'd say a vast majority of most cases. So you really need customers. If it's a tribal food sovereignty initiative, you've got, you're gonna need customers that value the local, the fresh, the organic, the nutrient dense um, products and are willing to pay a little more for that. Um, the, uh, it's gonna be a challenge to make a, make a profit, especially if you're trying to do social benefit 
activities like the nutrition education, the farm tours, the farm to school initiative. So the um, donating to the elderly center. So it's hard enough for market farmers to make a profit on their own. If you add the community benefit piece, um, it's really hard. So I wouldn't approach it necessarily as um, a new for-profit enterprise uh, for your tribe. So, um, and then be a, just, if you're just getting started or maybe if you're looking to expand, try to see if you already have existing tribal programs or assets so that you're not duplicating things, not um, uh, buying equipment or um, assets or things that may already exist. But once you kind of pull all the stakeholders together and you get an inventory between natural resources and the schools and the FDIPRA program and the um, uh, uh, 4-H initiatives, you've probably got a lot more pieces than you realize um, on the table there. So um, the last thing I would say is that if, if, again, if you're just getting started or if you're updating your strategic plan is really give some thought around what is the targeted impact you're trying to make in your community. Um, what are you trying to optimize for? Because that is an essential question to answer because you're gonna to have to make a lot of decisions about what your operation looks like. So is, is your primary goal cultural preservation? Is it, is it for profit? Are you really trying to make a profit with this? Um, is it about providing employment to your community members? Is it increasing your local food supply? Are you focused on improving health outcomes? being more resilient and having a, a stronger, um, more accessible local food system. Um, so really give some thought to, to the top one or two things that you're trying to do, and then your decisions will come from there. You're, you're gonna have to make choices about what you do and how you do it. And this is the question that's gonna help you make those choices. So again, I, I think um, some of the crew is on the call today. Daphne and Tamika, Daphne's our farm manager. She's been here since 2012. Tamika is our local foods coordinator. She's been with us for the past two or three years. She's um, doing our sales and marketing and grant writing and wears a lot of hats. So um, I know they're also in the field today. So, so they were gonna join if they could, but um, they may be with us. So Lee, hopefully that is um, what you wanted us to cover today. That was awesome. Thank you so much for sharing all of that information. Um, I absolutely appreciate how much work it is to grow something organically. So um, we grow, we're not certified organic, but we grow our corn organically too in Oneida. And I know Wally has a lot of the same, um, just barriers of having enough hands at the farm at the right time to do all of the work that needs to get done. Um, so thank you so much for your presentation, both Wally and John. Um, I think we all learned a lot about your farms and there are a lot of questions that came up. So I'm gonna um, just point these questions to you, John, since you're on right now um, and unmuted. Um, there was one question that I thought was really, um, really insightful. And the question is, will tribal farms help our communities get healthier by increasing the availability of organic and fresh foods and getting people out on the land, um, working and sweating and connecting with the earth again? I think so. I, I think um, without it, it's almost like um, it's out of sight, out of mind kind of thing. I, I think um, in our experience, there, there, was, there were some backyard gardens, there was some local farming, but not really at, at a large scale. So I think just having a tribal farming operation, whether it's a department or an enterprise or something like that, it just gives you a lot more ability to partner with the diabetes program, to partner with the tribal schools, to partner with the health center, um, to actually have farm tours, to, to, to take your market to the parking lot where the employees work and they they get to see it, they get to realize what's uh, fresh and seasonal. So I think it's just an excellent tool to take, um, to raise awareness, to raise participation, to get the kids volunteering and touring the farms. So you can't beat it. I mean, otherwise you have to take them to the grocery store and just try to tell them where the food came from, so. Absolutely, and a lot of our tribal communities are in food deserts. It's really hard to access those local foods if the tribe isn't producing them. So definitely 
Wally, did you want to address that question? I know you're also working on increasing food access with the farmers markets. Uh, yeah, uh, well, that's what we're kind of working for is to get people involved and like, you know, we're going to start doing it first and, and people do join in, you know, and we get calls like when we do the, uh, like I was saying, the people that do community service hours, they come out and, um, I've gotten numerous, uh, you know, the person that comes in and, and then like weeks later or so like they'll they'll on the weekend they'll bring their family out to show them the farm and then i'll hear back from that person's spouse or something and they'll say they're amazed at what we're doing out there and, and uh, that's the only thing about our farm is that we're way we're on a dead end road it's not something that you can the community can drive by and see so we're hoping when we do this tomato course that we're going to be bringing people out to the farm welcoming them out there and then i think that'll make a big difference and uh, we've always gotten a lot of, always get positive feedback about what, what we're doing. So I, I really see the community being involved with a lot of the things that we're doing, like as, as we grow and, and down further down the road. Awesome. Yeah, we've definitely seen the change too in Oneida with people who get started in the co-op and then they decide they're going to start a homestead farm or they're going to start growing a couple of acres just for their family. Um, so it's really great to see people come out and then get inspired to get more involved in agriculture on a personal level too. Um, another question that I think is sort of broad to both of you is, um, would tribal communities benefit from a standard certification? So the example that was given was halal um, or kosher. And I know this is something that has come up in conversations that I've had with different tribal farmers who are frustrated that their only options are organic um, or you know, standards that don't necessarily really fit um, the indigenous way of looking at agriculture or the indigenous way of looking at regenerating the soil. And I know there is the Made by American Indians label that's available through Intertribal Agriculture Council for finished products. But as far as um, thinking about a standard certification for indigenous farmers for their practices, is that something that the two of you have thought about or discussed with at all? Uh, what we're doing, like really when, what food sovereignty means is it's not just uh, growing the food, it means growing the food, uh, regulating it, processing it, packaging it, and distribution. It's the whole part of the food system and having ownership of all of that. And part, one of those links is, is the safety of the consumers. And we're a little ways from that, but Right now, we like with our eggs, we have to deal with USDA, you know, for inspections and all of that. We potentially, our tribe, we have a compliance department. But if they could become like a regulatory agency with our food, <clears throat> and I'll say like, um, we're with the eggs, you know, we do all the processing and we, it, it's, we distribute it and it's all, but we don't, we don't regulate. We're not regulating, you know, we don't. We don't govern the regulations on, on, on it. And there's that step. And the other step is that right now we purchase the feed for the chickens. But if we if our farm was developed enough where we could start growing our own grains for the chickens, that's close to, to owning those eggs almost entirely. You know? um, so that's that's what our goal is uh, from that, from getting that label or whatever tribal, uh, whatever you call it there. But, that would be another way of own another part of owning the food that we consume. So I hope to see, I hope to see it develop on our reserves. Yeah, that's something that's really taking shape through the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative is setting up tribal food codes. So they have a tribal food code project and a lot of tribes have participated in developing that big set of codes that they created. Um, and I don't think that any tribes yet have fully implemented their own tribal food codes so that they wouldn't necessarily need to follow the USDA standards. John, did you have any comments on that one? Yeah, just two quick uh, thoughts. So one is that the, the certified organic um, was a big challenge for us. There were no, there were no, to become certified organic, you have to have a third party 
evaluator come in and inspect. And we had to pay travel for somebody to travel from Florida to Choctaw Farms to, to become certified. So it was expensive um, and it was real tough. Um, and so I, I do think that there would be benefit in having like a, a, a tribally grown brand. You would just kind of have to think through how you would approach that. Um, there would have to be lots of input, lots of, um, uh, um, I think it would be a challenge to kind of put all that together, but I do think it would be a worthwhile effort to try to figure it out. Um, Absolutely. Um, so for the next question, it's about the um, Wolfing, which is the Worldwide Organ Opportunities on Organic Farms program, which you put your farm up and you can host volunteers that'll come and help on your farm. Usually they stay on the farm for a number of um, weeks or sometimes months. Is that something that you all are familiar with or considering looking into? I, I'm not familiar with that organization or whatever, but um, we get a lot of volunteer help and, and it sounds really great. And I'm not saying that it isn't, um, but at times it, it's, uh, it's kind of hard, you, you, you know, you get different people with different skills and abilities, scheduling, it, it's actually, it's involved, you know, in order to do it, it's involved. We continue to do it. We, we think we benefit from it, but it, there's a, you know, and then with, first it was like, because we're a tribal organization, there's a drug testing policy. Anybody that works on the farm has to be drug tested. And then there was the COVID thing. The, now it's the vaccination. There's a lot of these things that make it difficult to begin with. And, and then, uh, but I'm in favor of those things. You know, I, I think that uh, part of a lot of what we're doing is, uh, I say we do things unconventionally. We barter a lot. You know? we're, we're a tribal organization. It, it, it's a big process to buy something get a purchase order and it's a lot of things you got to go through but if we got things that we can barter like with, with the Amish it's just a, it's a boom there's we don't waste we don't lose any time you know and, and uh, so yeah I'm in favor of these things and, and with anything nothing's perfect you know there's bugs that you got to work out but I think when you get people involved with your program there's more ownership you know? and people feel like they're a part of it you know and that's what I'm hoping to do with our farm is that when people come out there it's not it's not the tribe's farm, it's our farm. You know? And I think those things start to support those feelings about what you're doing. You know, I would just add, I mean, I am familiar with that program. We have not tried it at Choctaw Fresh Produce. Our, our, I guess our focus has really been on trying to, to recruit tribal members in the community to, to, to get the skills. So. We haven't tried it. We've done some things similar to that with like the Teach for America, America AmeriCorps and things like programs like that, where we would have other people come to Choctaw to um, to work in a in a capacity like that. And we it's mixed results. I mean, it's it's um, um, sometimes it's a good fit. Sometimes it's not. But we have not tried it at Choctaw Fresh Produce. It's not something that we've talked about trying. We're trying to kind of grow our own folks locally that that want to stay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so the other question that I think is kind of broad scale is how do we promote agriculture and rangeland management degrees at our tribal colleges and universities? And I know there aren't tribal colleges and universities in the USET region. There's a couple here in Wisconsin, um, but they seem to be more focused on natural resources generally and not as much agriculture and rangeland management. Is that something that you all have connected into as the tribal colleges and universities and their programs? We haven't had a lot of that. I mean, uh, I, I still feel like we're really new. You know, we're really getting started. And uh, every, every you know, as time goes on, we make different connections and work with different organizations. But that's something that's maybe a little ahead of us right now. Um, but. And, and, and what we're doing, like we were a farming community when I when I was growing up, uh, I grew up on it. My father was a dairy farmer and all of the neighbors were dairy farmers. And, and uh, But we've gotten away from that. There aren't any more farms that, there's no one on the, on the reserve that makes a living off of farming. Anymore. Um, and it's, 
and a lot of the farm, like the people are getting older now, that thinking is always called, you know, there's a certain thinking about the farm. It's about baling the hay and milking the cows and that kind of thing. But it's really, when you really start looking at it, it's really more than, there's more to it than that. You know, there's, there's the soil part of this. And then, and then we're learning that when you, when you're, when you're farming, you're really involved with the weather, all of the elements. And then when you, when you're talking organically, you know, you're looking at ways you, you don't, you're not trying to get rid of weeds and pests and all of that. You're trying to manage them. You know, you work with them and you try to develop your, the way you farm to complement the way the nature is, you know, happening around it. And, and it's this, this, uh, and, and that's uh, that's what I kind of see in our in our community is that farming is that that impression that you get you know the guy that's got manure on his boots and you know and not that smart or something you know <laughs> but it's really and if once you start farming you realize you got to know what you, there's a lot of things you got to know and you got to understand you got to learn you got to research there are always things and the answers aren't always there some of it if we learn trial and error. But those are the, the most, those are what you remember. Those are the, when you, when you do get the experience and the education and what you're doing, those are the things that are valuable, the things that you work hard for. So, I don't know if I got off track with that. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, I, we don't have a, access to a tribal college in anywhere in our region. Uh, we do partner with um, the Land Grant University of Mississippi, Mississippi State University. Um, and they, I think our staff, uh, Tamika and Daphne, have actually gone to Mississippi State to do presentations. Their students have come down to visit and tour our farm. We've done some, we did a um, partnership with the Tuskegee University uh, where we did a demonstration of a certain uh, variety of, of crops with them. So we, we have actively partnered with colleges and universities. Um, we have an extension agent located on the reservation. and. I just talked to um, one of our former interns and employees, the, the tribal member, young girl that worked for us, and she's gone on to get her horticulture degree. So, um, uh, so I can't help but think that she got inspired by working in Choctaw Fresh Produce to go down that path. So, it's going to take time, but we we are seeing some some positive results. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, we're right at the top of the hour. So there's two more quick questions. Um, Wally, somebody was interested in learning more about your quality check that you did for the eggs and was wondering if you would mind sharing that. When we did the, uh, the workshop with the students, uh, it was it was well, actually we got kind of lucky. There was a uh, webinar that was available. So part of the training that they did was a webinar. It was uh, I think it was six weeks. They covered different aspects about egg production. And then in there, uh, they talked about the food safety parts where we learned about uh, about the washing temperatures, the time, the you know the refrigeration temperatures, and all of that. So it was all USDA um, guidelines, I guess, that we used. And the way that that works is that it was different. Uh, I guess it would be based on your scale and the number of birds that we have. We're actually like we're almost considered like a. a we're not a commercial operation, you know. There's commercial chicken operations in our area. They have, they they have like twenty thousand birds each. You know, they're they're only on a way different scale. They do way more eggs um, because of the scale that we're on. I, I wouldn't say that we're exempt from things, but it's we're not. Uh, we don't have like somebody that actually comes out, with surprise visits, and all of that. It's kind of like. And although we are retailing in the stores, I guess that's the difference there. If you sell them, like if you have chickens of your own, people can come to your farm and, and they, they fall under a different category of regulations. If they're buying from the farm, it's a little less strict. But if you're taking your product and you're processing it and you're making it available retail, it, it's it's more there's more uh, regulations that you need to follow. But we learned all of that in that course originally with the students, and we've just been following the same uh, the thing. And we've run into, like with our casino, uh, in the beginning, we couldn't sell eggs to our casino because they weren't inspected and stamped by the USDA. But, uh, you know, there's turnovers in, in the gaming industry, and, and 
we had new, there was new people, food and beverage, and the new person didn't care about it. It was speculation. So we sell eggs to the casino now. Um, they were they were okay that they're being sold in the stores, community member or, or you know, people can go buy them in the stores. So we supply the casino with eggs now. Um, and I don't know if I answered all of those questions. Uh, I think if we went to a bigger, if we went bigger, and I don't know, I know we're not near there yet, but if we went to much bigger scale, there would be, uh, we would probably uh, be more scrutinized. But, you know, really, I, I mean, like our staff, we, 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 we want to produce a good product. And we're really conscious of both. Um, and I say to our, whenever we start something new, we start a new project, a new effort or something, I say to the staff, I say, we got to hit, when we do this, we got to, we got to hit a home run with it. Everything we do, we got to hit a home run. It's all about our reputation. And if we were to have something, a food illness or something that would, it would really hurt us. We know that. And, and we're really conscious about putting a, a safe uh, food product out there. Thank you. Um, so the last question was just about if we also are planting beans and squash in Oneida and the answer is yes. Uh, when we started using the hiller, we plant the three sisters together on those hills. So we have, we call it the women's field. We have that field going to be starting up again this year. So hopefully it'll be more successful than last year. Last year, the cranes ate every single corn plant that we planted. And so we're going to be working harder to keep the cranes out of our field this year. And hopefully we're moving fields so they won't know where we are. <laughs> Um, I think that's it. If you all have further questions, please get in touch with me or these two amazing speakers um, directly. Um, and I really hope to see you tomorrow and the following day for days two and three. We're going to have some great presentations on ecosystem restoration and then utilizing some of the programs that we talked, out, talked about here um, in tribal farms. So, Yonko, thank you all so much and uh, we'll see you tomorrow.